joy is one of those things that is like really personal to people. We were joking around, you know, everyone has their joyful face. <laughs> joy through intensity, joy through laughter, joy through dancing, joy through seriousness. <laughs> Are all Christians supposed to be joyful and happy? Yes, at some point. Well, that's what we're here to talk about because yeah. it doesn't seem like it's easy to be happy all the time. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. I and say, again, I say rejoice. Again. I, I was going to say, explain at some point for me. Seriously. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there's seasons of grief. There's sorrowful yet rejoicing type stuff going on. But, you know, I just think the complexity and the nuance of that is like, you know, I think everybody would recognize if someone just lost a dear loved one, I don't think it would be appropriate to go up to them and say in that moment, rejoice in the Lord always. And then they're like, you know, like, what are they supposed to do? Um, and so I, I think that's what I mean. I think there's, there's situations and seasons or circumstances and seasons, that's your phrase, mm -hmm. in which we really, you know, in the moment, the, the emotion that seems to be kind of pervasive and on the surface is grief and sorrow. Um, but, you know, as Paul says, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. And I think hope produces joy, which we'll, I talked about Sonny, we'll probably talk about again here. But so, yeah, that's all I mean. I don't mean that that joy, you know, joy is always present in a sense. And joy is in a sense waiting is going to be there when the grief ends. You know, it says joy comes in the morning. So I, I, think I love that last part. Uh, to like, yeah, you're, you're talking about tact, going to like a graveside. Yeah. However, you know, Paul also says sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Hmm. And it is appropriate for us to even like look at each other as brothers in Christ and be like, hey, don't forget that when you're at the graveside, you know, you can still rejoice. You can say it almost now. We don't now. mourn as others do. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that gets, a. I mean, again, I, I just think the that gets even harder when the, the loved one that you lost you know, may or may not, you don't know if they're with the Lord. And so it's like, at that point, you're rejoicing in the Lord's, that the, you know, for, at least for me, how I process that is, will not the judge of the earth do what's right? And so I'm rejoicing literally in the Lord. But I just think it looks and feels a lot different than sometimes mm -hmm. the way we normally talk about joy. Um, so. The expression Which and the experience thing. of joy. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Back to your first question. Mm -hmm. Because there's got to be some sense, I mean, even... You know, to quote the text, it's like, well, you know, certainly God must have been aware of those circumstances, and yet still there is some reality to rejoicing, and so that's, you know, it's pretty profound. Yeah. Well, and the reason we brought it up is because you specifically, Dan, are so expressive. <laughs> always. <laughs> your joy, like we can, we can walk into this building and sleeve. know you're joyful and know when you're upset. It's just so, you know, upfront. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> are you are you upset with Smile me right the camera, now? Everybody. Are you you're happy right now? Um. Enough about me. Let's talk about joy. How do you go about pursuing joy? So maybe maybe you're in one of those um, experiences where grief is like obvious. Like you got something very clear that you should be in grief or sorrow about. Maybe you don't. Maybe you just kind of have an absence of joy and you just kind of wake up and you think, why, you know, maybe I feel like I should be happier than I am. You know, what are some tangible things that people can do, you know, moving forward to actually like pursue joy? Let me tidy that up. Thanks. Before this question. <laughs> Yikes. Not, that, that was a I'll messy question. <laughs> no, no, not the question. The the conversation before, yeah. which oh, yeah. leads to this Um. Because you great. said this yesterday, and actually in your answer, you just tipped your hat again to what Paul says. The, the, key, the key to rejoicing in sorrowful moments of grief and mourning is you're rejoicing in the Lord. Right. Paul literally says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I said rejoice. You did this yesterday in your sermon when you're like, well, at least I still have blank. And whatever that thing is, like that's, that's your God. That's your ultimate joy, your ultimate peace, your ultimate hope, whatever that may be. It's like, well, yeah, if, if you are in Christ, the pain and sorrow and grief of a loss might be literally completely overwhelming. But what will keep you, if you are in Christ, from surrendering to that and then just 
living a life of despair mm-hmm. is you're going somewhere in the somewhere in your mind and in your heart and your soul you're going at least Jesus is still alive right mm-hmm. at least you know this is every, everything that is sad will become untrue you know what I mean like mm-hmm. those types of things which again you was in our, our reading yesterday so mm-hmm. I just want to tied it by saying like that that is the substance of our joy now how we experience that and express that and pursue that that's now where this question comes in uh dan yeah what do you got mike yeah i think just to um tidy up the tidy up tidy up the tidy up yeah there you go (laughs) is there's a a reference in habakkuk chapter three which i yeah this is good finding here habakkuk zephaniah there we go old testament yeah. When so the the context for Habakkuk is that Judah has been unfaithful and that God is sending the Chaldeans to judge Judah and send them into captivity and Habakkuk's like what that is the plan? Mm-hmm. Like they're less godly than we are. Mm. And so he's pretty frustrated but by the end he says though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines the produce of the olive will fail the fields yield no food the flock be cut off from the fold and there's no herd in the stalls it's like that mm. is a very dire situation which actually is what kind of happened when you know Babylon came and laid siege to Jerusalem and all that kind of stuff mm. and then he says yet i will rejoice in the lord i will take joy in the God of my salvation. And so I think you see two things there. Again, the in the Lord part, like you were saying, though, that's not circumstantially based, but there's still joy. Joy still exists, uh, even even though there's all those temporal losses. But then also, he says, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. He knows that the other prophets have prophesied that there will be a return from exile, Mm -hmm. that a day is coming when there will be you know, oil on the vines, and there will be grapes on the vine, and like all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, it's not just like this stoic, like I'm going to just rejoice in God, and He's never going to change my circumstance. It's the joy comes from the fact that as horrible as my circumstances may or may not be right now, one day in Jesus Christ they are going to change, and so I will, you know, I'll have hope and I'll have joy that way. So, mm-hmm. anyway, there's a, there's a sense in which you know, Nehemiah, a, you mentioned this verse kind of in passing yesterday, you've got a lot of circumstances surrounding the people of God here. You know, there's a back and forth to an exile, there's a rebuilding of the, the temple and the, and the city, and you've got people who are speaking against it, you've got threats, you've got a lot of unknown happening in the future, and then you have this long reading of God's word among his people, they're standing for hours, and, it, and the people are weeping. And then Nehemiah says to the people, and Ezra, um, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, verse 9. So basically, he looks at their mourning and weeping and tells them to stop. And then in verse 10, he says, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so there is a sense sometimes where it's appropriate to speak into some kind of weeping or mourning or grief and say, uh, you know, not this is foolish and stop, not that you shouldn't be doing it, but at some point it's actually appropriate to say, hey, the joy of the Lord is actually the strength that you need. Uh, they're weeping there because they had disobeyed and rebelled and now the Lord has accepted them, correct? There's questions. There's mm-hmm. questions about are is there like guilt from the past? Is it mourning over exile? Is it because this is the first time they've heard the word of God read in a long time again and they're like, you know, overwhelmed by it? Yeah. There's a lot of conversation about why the, the mourning and the weeping, mm-hmm. but the but the point is there is there is a, a speaking into that act that says okay now it's time to stop that now is the time to rejoice and celebrate go eat food and drink and like rejoice because the strength that you need I think is the implication here uh, is going to come from joy in the Lord and rejoicing mm-hmm. so sometimes it is appropriate to speak into settings and just say hey all right. We're going to celebrate. <laughs> yeah. What are we celebrating? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like the first thing that maybe you do in order to pursue joy is sometimes to recognize, you know, maybe what type of grieving it is and like <laughs> address it. You know, maybe maybe I'm grieving and it's not the time to grieve, you know, kind of going back to there being a time for everything. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe there's just a time where I need to like <laughs> – 
tell myself that I am happy in the Lord and hope that my thought process follows suit? I mean, is that is that correct? I mean, yeah, well, people you, might be there. Yeah, you know, I've been I've been a little bit of you know. I'm, on a horse on this, and not on a horse. What's the soapbox? That's what I'm on. That's what I'm on. <laughs> no, on a horse. You're right. You <laughs> got it the first time. Yeah. Anyway, Pastor Mike's on a horse. As, as I was galloping along, <laughs> no, <laughs> say it every day around here. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, I really think that understanding hobby horse, hobby horse. There it is. There I don't want to beat a dead horse. There was, <laughs> there was, there, there was, was a lot m- there. Multiple <laughs> horses. Oh, well, we got that taken care of. Only yeah. want, well, by the way, only want to beat living horses? Is that the implication of that statement? Strange, right? Yeah. I don't want to beat any horses. <laughs> <laughs> I think the mindset issue of, of Christians understanding who they are and what Jesus did is just so, so essential to understanding yeah. joy. Like you were, you were under the realm of Satan and sin. That was the status that you were in. Mm-hmm. And then when you believe the gospel, you transferred realms. And so this is why, you know, you, we talk about joy existing and all these other things. There's a realm that you're in this new realm. You're in a new creation. And the virtues of that new creation, one of them is joy. The fruit of the spirit, which is the fruit of the new creation, is joy. And so it's just there. It's mm-hmm. always there mm-hmm. because that's the realm you're in. Now, you happen to be living in the overlap of the realms, like you still are subject to sin and suffering and trials and temptations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so there will be, you know, Dave, you said this a couple weeks ago, this is overlap of joy and peace. Like the days of suffering are numbered. They're numbered. Why? Because you transferred realms. Yeah. You're no longer in Adam, but you are in Christ. Right. And so the idea of renewing your heart and mind in Christ is like, yeah. And so it's like, and so you can actually say to your suffering and to your sorrows, I am going to rejoice today. Why? Because you actually do have something to rejoice in. Right. And so now again, sometimes the overwhelming, you know, the temporal loss is so acute and so strong. It's like right. it's you know, it's like, uh, you know, this is that could be cold comfort for someone. And obviously, I would want to be careful how I would speak into that to somebody else. But certainly to myself, you see this with the psalmist quite a bit. Why are you cast down on my soul? Hope in God. Like like the day of salvation. Right. Has for us has dawned already. You already have a, the spirit. And then it's and the the full fullness is coming. So yeah, I, I think part of the is is a is a is it's really just faith and and hope that work through love. You know, we've been using the word mindset quite a bit, which I, I think is helpful. So I think that is a massive part. Uh, and then cultivating that. You know, think about that. How that would happen if 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 a big part of your Christian existence was day by day acknowledging and living in the realm of Christ by faith one year, two years, five years, ten years, then you're going to be strong. And so when the difficulties and sorrows and sufferings come your way, you have a you have all this experience to speak into them and say, in, into my grief that I can still rejoice. Joy has something to say yeah. to our lives mm-hmm. and to our despair and to our grief. You know, it, and I think one of the encouragements here is that it will not – produce in you what you need to endure this life if you never pursue or cultivate joy. Yes. It's necessary for your life. And it's going to be hard won sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like it's going to have to be a fight and a battle. Mm. But there are going to be days where it's just like you've got to make a decision to receive joy, engage in it, pursue it. And again, whether that's having a meal and a glass of wine or it's you know, hanging out with some friends and playing cards or like what, whatever it may be at you desperately. And again, this is where it's like in the Lord, right? At some point for you to be able to endure this life, you are going to need to make a decision that goes against your grief to choose joy and be thankful and celebrate what you do have and what God has promised and what he's going to do. Yeah. I think to that, like the privilege like what we're rejoicing, and you brought up two categories right there, which is important. I want to touch base on that. Like you've got these kind of um, earthly joys that God has given to us as good gifts that we need to enjoy. We we must celebrate with them. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think I think it's First Timothy six that God has given us all things richly to enjoy. Yeah, the word joy is right in there. And so, and then 
there's this other category, what I was just talking about a second ago, which I do think is like a deeper way and it, it enables you to yep. handle those joys properly, yep. is this is to me profound. You have the, the joy of Christ is mediated to you. It comes to you sometimes through gifts. But ultimately, the joy of Christ is given to you. It's mediated to you through the gift of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. So in Romans 8, Paul says this. This is profound. He says that his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. So it's like it's like there's nothing mediate. There's like a direct connection of like joy can touch my heart because the Holy Spirit of God is touching my heart. And so it's mm-hmm. like I'm pursuing – and so again, not that we're we're not promoting pursuing experience for experience sake, but – Right. Good night. This is, you know, I know this is what your heartbeat is, and this is like, hey, is this real or not? Right. Is the kingdom of God here or right. not? Like, right. the kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace. And so if my joy, like that immediate, like when I say immediate, I don't mean fast. I mean it's not mediated by anything. So I don't actually, this is why Habakkuk can be true. I don't need the fruit on the vine yeah. to actually have joy because I have immediate access to God's joy through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when I'm cultivating and experiencing that kind of joy, man, it's like indestructible. And then I can I can freely enjoy good gifts without turning them into idols because the, they're not the bottom like I was saying before the, oh, the, in the sermon, like, um, oh, geez, now I can't remember. You guys said it, like the the comparison thing. What did I say? The, uh, at least I have this. At least I have this. Like, the at least I have turns into, mm-hmm. well, at least I have the joy of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, well, I've got that. And so that way I don't misuse God's gifts. And I also don't misuse my trials or wallow in my trials or, like, you know, don't let my the joy of Christ speak into my trials. Yeah. So like immediate access to the joy, the joy of the Lord. Literally, I'm get Jesus. I'm giving you my joy, and so that does. So I've actually thought about that because my personality, like, you know, <laughs> I said it. You know, in the, I think it was the second service. I was like, I was a little bit emotional. I was like mm-hmm. crying. I was like, this is me being happy. <laughs> <laughs> like, true, which is true for you. <laughs> yeah, it is. And like I am, you know, Dan gives me a hard time, which is good, and I receive it. Like I'm an intense guy, and so like I'm happiest when I'm most intense. And so, you know, my kids have said to me, Dad, can we just play a game? Like, you know, like, do all, do all of our, like, we, how do I have a good time? Let's talk about deep, hard things. And I'm like, oh, man, that was great. <laughs> so One man's happy is another man's terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that being said, like, I've thought about the righteousness of God is, or the king of God's righteous joy and peace. It's like, do people think of me as a joyful person? It's not just what they think, but like, it is important. Like, yeah. joy is something that must be pursued. As a, it's not, yeah. and again, to say it's not optional, it's like God's requiring me to be happy. Well, I guess I, that's the kind of God I want to worship. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's it's like um, if you're a Christian, you should experience joy and exuberate joy more than non Christians. Right, right. Like you just should. <laughs> yeah, and you have more to be happy about. Yeah, and and that doesn't mean you're the loudest, bubbliest, funniest, you you're laughing all the time. It's it. There is a sense in which it, this is an inner sense and presence of joy, but it, it is also demonstrated. Like mm-hmm. it's evident, it's noticeable, and it's explicitly tied to hope and peace for sure. I mean, we can be joyful because of the hope that's to come, because shalom exists and it will exist finally and forever, yeah. because love exists, et cetera. But you know, I, I mean, I've, I've said to people close in my life, myself included, in the mirror more than anything, it's just like you know, you don't, hey, you don't, you know, you can actually be happy right now if you want to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can just make the decision right now to be joyful, and it will do crazy wonderful things for you and those around you, like beginning right now Mm. we could just make the decision right now to pursue joy and that i think is what the lord asks of us in fact even his commandments that he gives us john 15 he says i'm giving you these commandments i command these i say these things to you so that my joy might be in you and your joy would be full and so they're they're just we we should be joyful people Mm. So what do you say to the person who says, well, I don't want to just, you know, 
put on a face. I don't just want to put a good face on. I don't want to be a hypocrite. This is my authentic self. <laughs> I'm mad right now. I'm frustrated right now. What do you say to what do you guys say to that question? Because again, the church has been accused mm-hmm. of hypocrisy, hypocrisy, fake, and like all that. you know, like we don't actually lament. Like we talk about having lament Sundays around mm-hmm. here. Like so, what do we say to that? James says, "Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you." It's like you know, this is why prayer is the fuel of the Christian life. You just got to tell Jesus, "I'm ticked off, and I don't want to be happy. I don't." Want to but the whole, I don't want to put on a face thing. Well, then it, apply that to every area of your life, and you might as well sit in a closet and never come out. It's like, well, I don't want to put on a face and sing a song. I don't want to put on a face and raise my hands in worship. I don't want to put on a face and like you know read the scripture. I don't want to put on a face and show up for solitude when I'm not there. I don't want to put on a face and give money. You know what I mean? It's like that isn't everything. And so you can't just pigeonhole that to joy. We engage in things all the time that are good and necessary so that we can get there. That's the practices. I cannot produce things in me. What can I do? I'm setting aside a time, uh, you know, I'm, I'm setting aside time for God to do what only he can do in my life. It's like, well, how am I going to get joy? It's not going to be by avoiding and neglecting it and, you know, living in this self-dooming hypocrisy, you know, mm-hmm. circle. It's like, I'm going to have to get out and do something. And just to, you know, hit this again, it's communal. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about how hope like withers in isolation and flourishes in community. That's all these things. Mm-hmm. Joy totally withers in isolation and flourishes in community. Sometimes the joy that I need, you know, the strength that I receive from joy isn't my own joy. It's the joy of those around me that mm-hmm. like stirs something and does something in me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, I appreciate the question. I've for sure been there sometimes too. And sometimes you just wake up and be like, well, I don't, I don't want to be joyful. It's like, no, what you're saying is you don't want to smile and laugh and do like fun things. You're not in the mood. Mm-hmm. And that, you're saying that's okay sometimes. That is okay. Mm-hmm. And, that's necessary. And the other thing is I feel like you just need to like get out of yourself. Like, I feel like you're too consumed with, like, what you think is the reality Mm. of your life. Like, that's kind of all of our Christian life is one of just acknowledging that there is something more real than what I'm feeling and experiencing right now. Exactly. Very good. And Mm. so if I am actually acknowledging that there is something that's more true about myself than what I feel. Yes, then you're going to experience joy. You yep. won't be faking anything yep. because you will actually be putting your hope and your joy and your peace. And by the way, that will produce love mm-hmm. because you'll acknowledge that this experience and this thing that I'm feeling is not actually what's true about me or mm-hmm. not actually what I should be experiencing. And you need to like, like Sinclair Ferguson would say, you need to get out of yourself and get into Christ. Like, mm-hmm. so you need to just totally abandon that sense of just like inner mm-hmm. reflection and just ex- and mm. acknowledge the actual realities that yeah. are there. Don't let you yourself be the judge of what's yes. most deeply real. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Exactly. When again, that goes back that's to that's faith. That, that's everything. Yeah, that's the status thing I'm talking about. Exactly. I, I, I wonder how many times we don't really. I use the word real there again. We don't genuinely acknowledge the fact that I've been transferred into the kingdom of right. Christ. Right. Like I am actually in Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's this there's this thing with transparency where at some point like that kind of got elevated. Like the goal is yeah. just to be transparent. Mm-hmm. And I think out of a good thing, like we don't want to be fake, we don't want to be artificial. We don't want to be fronting. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> exactly. Oh. <laughs> but if I'm like in a relationship with another person and I'm always telling them like how mad they're making me and how much <laughs> I hate them. I mean, sure I should be praised for transparency, but <laughs> I would want to like change the way I think and feel at some point. You should be point. judged for how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, at, at some point, I think, you know, that transparency is helpful to get to the goal of joy, but just the transparency of, well, I'm venting all of this, like, you know, sludge is going back to our previous conversations. Like, yeah, that's more helpful than hiding it and being fake and being artificial, but there's still there's work to be to done. That. And there's <laughs> yeah. remedy to that. Yeah. It's like, yeah, this is actually what I'm feeling, but I need to be out of this because of a truer reality about myself. Right. Mm-hmm. And so there's a remedy to that sickness that you're feeling. It's not just, oh, I'm sick, so 
there's no hope for me now. It's like, well, actually, no, yeah. there is. And that's what the whole gospel is about. Because we don't want to look joyful. We want to be, yeah, joyful. be joyful. Yeah, yeah. What are we, okay, what are we asking people to do? <laughs> what What is Jesus asking of us when he wants his joy to be in us? We're not talking about a personality trait. Mm-hmm. I think that like most people who know me think that I'm like a joyful person. But, but what they mean is like, I'm peppy and I'm loud. <laughs> Outgoing, yeah, extrovert, I'm whatever. I'm going to laugh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're not saying, oh, hey, you know, you you better make sure you laugh. Like mm-hmm. this week is tough. Like mm-hmm. sometimes. Which the, helps. Sometimes. For sure. <laughs> but we're talking about a fruit mm-hmm. of the spirit right. that is evident when you are abiding in Jesus. And so it just means That's sometimes, good. sometimes um, th- the experience of joy is actually choosing to not be in despair or to not be discontent or not allow this untrue thought to like entangle all of my emotions mm-hmm. and my experience or to cause me to neglect other good things and not love those around me. Sometimes the act and, and presence of joy is more what you're choosing not to do rather than like, all right, now I'm gonna have a party, invite everybody over mm-hmm. and it's gonna be hilarious. And you know, it's like, mm-hmm. that's I think just a, a that's improper great. That's definition a of the world. Helpful distinction for sure. Like we keep mentioning these other words, peace, hope, right. love. And so, you know, there's a sense in which all of these concepts are connected. Big you know, time. we could even ask it this way: like, are these? You know, as we're just thinking specifically about these four things with Advent, like, are these four different things? Or are these just like four different aspects of one thing, which is you know, being confident in Christ, knowing who you are? Yeah, I would say that um, based on First Corinthians thirteen, yep. that there is a little bit of a distinction from these four terms that we're using for Advent. So, just in case mm-hmm. you didn't know, it's Hope, peace, joy, and love. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says that there's faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Love never fails. Or means He's actually saying it doesn't mean that it doesn't fail. It just means it never stops. Yep. Mm-hmm. You're always going to be loving. Our I experience w- in the new heavens and new earth will be love, will yes. be joy. Will, exactly. Will be shalom. Mm-hmm. But there, we won't need faith and hope in the same way that right. we need them now. So I would because say— Because who hopes for what he sees? Exactly, Romans 8. That's what you preached on peace. So, so faith and hope have an end. The way—so here's what I think. Those two things right now generate, or that's the way—I would say more it's like a doorway or a bridge for us to experience the new creation realities. Boom. It's interesting in the— in That the, was good, Mike. In the fruit of the Spirit, faith and hope— Sorry, wrong one. <laughs> Yikes. Sorry, listener. We'll edit yeah. that out. Yeah. The, Don't do it. The faith and hope are not listed in the fruit of the Spirit. Mm. And so, you know, I, I think those two things are the way that now in the midst, even though because we live in the overlap of the ages, the already not yet, we can experience the new creation realities of joy and peace and long suffering, all those things because of faith, faith and hope. And, hope. Mm-hmm. and so that is so good. So the new creational realities, Dan, to answer your question, overlap a lot. Joy and peace, um, you know, they, they're, they're, those would be kind of like the big ones at the head of the list. Um, those things exist now as we connect to the Holy Spirit, and we connect to the Holy Spirit. James, or not James, uh, Galatians tells us through faith. How did you get the Spirit? By works of the law? No, by hearing with faith. And so, as we exercise the muscle of hope Man. and faith, we experience new creation realities of peace and joy, even in suffering and sorrow. And love's going to end up being the expression of these things. It's going to get us outside of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's like it's the purest form. You know, so hope is the bridge between the already not yet. We get to experience the realities of the new heavens and the new earth, God's kingdom here and now. We choose it. We embrace it. It exists. We pursue it. And, the, you know, Paul says what matters is faith then working through love. Mm-hmm. And so now we're going we're gonna to be looking outward and I'm going to choose to get out of myself a little mm-hmm. bit, and I'm going to experience joy and peace in more incredible ways by laying down my life for others and serving them and helping them experience shalom and bringing peace to my, the community around me and and lifting people's spirits when they're you know discouraged and weary. Yeah, I think you know becoming people of love. We've been using that phrase, practicing the way we use that phrase. Um, I love that emphasis that you're drawing out there, Dave, in terms of like the communal nature of these things. If I'm really rejoicing in the Lord, that joy is contagiously communal. Big time. 
And so, you know, you insert a person of joy into a grieving community. They're going to be sensitive to the grief, but they're going to be a positive, like... Presence. Presence. Exactly. You, you know, the same thing with peace you talked about. You know, when you're a person of peace, you become a peacemaker. You look to be a mender of relationships, husbands and wives, parents and children, brothers and sisters in Christ. You're consistently looking uh, to not just uh, enjoy that peace for yourself, like some kumbaya moment, or just, you know, be selfish. But when these things are connected to the Holy Spirit, they're very communal. Uh, and Philemon, Philemon is a letter written to a uh, master, Philemon, and his slave at the time, whose name was Onesimus, and Paul was trying to bring these two guys back together, but he, he praised Philemon in the beginning of the letter uh, by saying that Philemon was, uh, what's he say here, I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, yeah. because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. And so, yeah, I definitely think that there's this real beautiful communal when we're experiencing these things like the peace overflows and we become peacemakers we we integrate and we bring wholeness and and joy as as we celebrate and we're just like you know when if someone really is grieving it's like we kind of like pick them up so yeah i think there's definitely communal aspects and if those things aren't there then we need to go back and re-examine what are we really rejoicing yeah. in yes so i think that's yeah. a helpful test for us too it's amazing you know piggyback off of that you think about the importance of the body paul obviously talks about in first corinthians chapter 12 and then ephesians 4 each member working properly we've mentioned that here and on sundays you know dozens of times as well builds itself up into love and you think about that kind of like explicitly of the gifts that people have the abilities that they have that they can like help serve each other one another but we not only need each other's like gifts and abilities we need each other's circumstances it's it, like it grounds us, it, it keeps us tethered to the kingdom and the story. And so if it, in a community, if you're in a, in a season of suffering and I'm in a season of abundance, me engaging in your life keeps me from my abundance becoming a God Yep. and me un- enjoying it a- away from God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my abundance can come in and encourage you of God's goodness and that things won't always be this way. Mm-hmm. And then oftentimes what will happen is then we'll switch. Yep, right. <laughs> Sorry. We'll switch <laughs> circumstances. But it's like I, I, don't, I don't just need Chase and his personality and his gifts and his strengths and his wisdom. My life and like needs his circumstances as well to speak into mind. And that's where like joy and peace and hope become really integrated in how we love one another. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, even like at a superficial level, you know, complaining can be contagious, Mm -hmm. like in a team environment or a workplace environment. And so, you know, on the flip side, the people who are even just like, again, like at the superficial level, you know, you're positive, you're optimistic, you're happy, you're joyful even that has some sort of effect on the people around you. And then, you know, how much deeper and more pervasive is Mm -hmm. this, you know, being in Christ? So, you know, lots of people probably find themselves in situations like that. Like maybe even they're in a challenging work environment where there is a lot of like complaining and destruct, you know, not a lot of joy maybe Mm -hmm. on the team and maybe even Mm -hmm. like, probably from some people's perspective, maybe rightly so. You Mm -hmm. know, maybe you're an employee and you're like overworked and you're underpaid and you're not appreciated, you know. And so sometimes I think maybe our justice thing will kick in and, you know, we want to like point that out or complain or whatever it would be. So what, you know, what encouragement would you offer to, to folks that might be in a situation like that or something similar to that to, you know, be an agent of joy uh, in their context? You know, how would you help them get started? I like the concept of being an agent of joy. Think about that if that was how you thought of your job. Mm. Um, I am an agent of joy, which is what we are. (laughs) We're ambassadors of peace and joy. Anyway, I would say two things, uh, two-step process. I would say if there is a justice issue going on, it ought not to be ignored. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the second step. I think that you would want to, in a sense, direct your heart. Again, this is where, 
you know, Paul says, or Peter says, set or prepare your mind for action, Peter says. Get your mind set right. Gird up the loins of your mind. <laughs> there you go. The old King James. <laughs> King James. <laughs> That's the first thing you need to do is to gird, gird up, up the your loins. loins. <laughs> Get ready to run. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, <laughs> Got the right one that time. <laughs> so, but seriously, Paul said, would say, set your mind, Colossians mm-hmm. 3, on Christ. And specifically, the promises of Christ this is so interesting. You bring, bring up the work. He says that you don't do it unto men anyway. Mm-hmm. Right. And so all of the offense that you're taking because these men or women aren't acknowledging what you're doing, you need to like speak into that with the hope of Christ, and then that will produce the joy of Christ that, oh, actually, I'm doing this for the Lord. He sees, and he is yeah. going to reward mm-hmm. me, not for the, not if I like – shared the gospel at my workplace, but for how I did my job Mm -hmm. is is my understanding of that text. So Mm. that's the first step is to is to cultivate a pattern and a powerful experience of a mindset where I'm actually serving Christ here. And then if indeed there is an injustice, you might get through that process of Christ, of renewing your heart and mind. You might have your a new look on your circumstances. Like maybe it's not as bad as you thought, or maybe it's worse. And now, though, that you have that, you know, kind of, you know, I don't know how exactly you would decide that you've arrived at, at a strength position of strength there, but I think the Lord can give you wisdom. But from that position of strength, I feel like you can speak into that situation with more wisdom and with more clarity than ever before. And so there are definitely matters of justice, and you know, maybe it's even efficiency or something else like that with your workplace. But I feel like, man, until we've really developed an in Christ experiential practice of our work that we are a little bit kind of shooting in the dark as to like what's really wrong and what needs to get fixed. Mm -hmm. So that's my, that's what I would say. Uh, In the beginning of this podcast, Mike, you mentioned that joy sometimes like has the posture of waiting. Mm -hmm. So just thinking like concluding thoughts, um, If you find yourself in a season where it's very difficult right now, and again, you know, we know a lot of scenarios, and for good reason, to like grab a hold of joy and be happy or experience gladness and rejoice, that whole, though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning, is like a really deep companion. And it's almost like you just need to be encouraged that present with you is the person of Jesus who is himself our joy. His joy is a companion to you and is waiting tactfully Mm -hmm. with you in your sorrow, in your sadness, in your grief, in your longing. And whenever the night ends, (laughs) joy will still be there. Mm -hmm. And there will be a day coming where you will be able to stand up, whether it needs to be tomorrow or the day after, however the Lord leads, and you will have a meal, you know, however metaphorically you want to take that, yeah. mm-hmm. and you will be able to rejoice. And so I just think it's a really good reminder that joy is available. It's present with you. It is a companion in the person of Jesus. It's a fruit of the Spirit that you are, you know, meant to ex- to know is present and then be able to grab a hold of and, like, drink freely of it. Mm-hmm. And that's even what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Like, he's speaking to a bunch of people mm-hmm. who, on the surface— and in the world standards, are not happy, go lucky mm-hmm. people at all by any stretch. Mm. They're people who are mourning. They're people who aren't smart. They're poor in spirit, and they're outcasts. Whatever. Mm-hmm. And Jesus literally comes to them and says, "Blessed are you." Mm-hmm. And why? It's because of the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's the well. At least I have the kingdom of God. Yes. Mm-hmm. The mourners can be happy, can be blessed because they have the kingdom of God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They have that pervasive sense of well-being, to use Dallas Willard's uh, terminology. So mm-hmm. that is mm. actually what comes to you and meets you in your circumstance, is what Jesus promised to all of this big group of outcasts at the Sermon on the Mount. That's the whole point, and that's what Jesus is telling us, and that's what we need to like hang our hat on and hope in, even in the midst of our near um, uncertain circumstances. Mm-hmm. And to remember in that workplace, you are in the kingdom of God. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. This weekend is a little different. It is. We have four morning services, two <laughs> afternoon services. <laughs> no, we don't. Three evening, <laughs> a candlelight service. 
It was great. <laughs> but Christmas Eve service, we're still going to address the last. Yeah. Christmas Eve meaning no Sunday morning. There's no morning services this Sunday. It's 4 and 5.30. 4 and yep. 5.30. So the last one love. is love. Love. Yeah, and it's, it's going to be the culmination. You know, love is what remains. Mm-hmm. All that matters in this life is faith working through love. Um, knowledge puffs up. Love builds up, and we're building each other up into love. So we're going to talk about how really the greatest experience this side of heaven of hope and joy and peace is going to be when we lay down our lives to serve one another. And we see this perfectly in the coming down of Jesus, who mm-hmm. did just Amen. that. That's good. So Sunday night, our only two services on Sunday, 4 and 5.30 Christmas Eve, we will light the fourth candle. But if you want to have the full effect of Advent, there's five candles. There's five candles. You got to come Monday morning, 10 a.m. 10 a.m. for that our Christmas, Christmas service. And then are we going to record this after that service? I was wondering Christmas that. Day? I was wondering that like an hour ago. <laughs> when are what are when are we recording Sermon Plus? Signing we're, off until 2024. Be, we're all going to be in different states, I think. <laughs> well, it Who might knows? not happen, but maybe it will. We'll see. Go bring joy in the holiday season. (laughs) Amen. Amen.